of the series of international architects. This evening is uh, a kind of a special uh, evening uh, because it uh, it's special because it ties in um, not only with the international theme of the of the uh, public lectures that we've been uh, hosting this fall, but also with the show that's in the gallery, the Alto exhibit. And I thought it would be especially appropriate to have an architect speak on Alto who had worked uh, in the Alto studio in Helsinki. Our speaker tonight is Eric Vertainen, uh, who was born in Helsinki and came here as a young man, uh, teenage, and uh, was educated in California, graduated from the University of California at Berkeley and then went back to Helsinki and worked with Alto. Some of the projects that he worked on was the, uh, were the International uh, Institute, uh, Education Institute in New York, that famous uh, interior uh, photograph that uh, we're familiar with, with the wonderful Alto wooden sculptures on the wall. And uh, he was, uh, among other projects that he worked on, uh, he was project architect for the uh, Mount Angel Library in Oregon. Uh, we're very pleased to welcome tonight Eric for a time in. gallery for a reception uh, honoring Mr. Victorian and for those of you who haven't seen the show we'll welcome you there and we'll share some wine and conversation and one other uh, announcement I was asked to make is, is that uh, Berkeley Street becomes a private uh, street at this point in Nebraska just where fire starts and one night a year they close it off at midnight, so our cars must all be out by midnight, or they turn into something. Okay, thank you. I was hoping I'd have a podium here I could, you know, hold on to, but uh, I think I'll manage. Uh, what I like to do is uh, first make a few statements about Alto and his architecture and then show a rather extensive series of slides having toured the exhibit, some of which are very similar to those. However, uh, uh, I can elaborate on the buildings and my views about the buildings. Uh, I think it's appropriate to uh, show the slides because as uh, maybe you all know that Altos, one of his favorite statements was to say, I don't talk, I build. And most of the time when he had international guests visiting him, he would send them out to look at his buildings rather than talk to them about them. In fact, he didn't talk to, about those buildings to us even working in the office. We had to go look at his buildings and then work in his office and understand them. So it was a kind of a process of osmosis, sort of by seeing and feeling and being there, you learn then to uh, to work on his designs, to do the detailing and so on. Uh, so therefore I'm saying that few words and then lots of pictures. Uh, the only problem with pictures is that they are not the real things. So it's not like going to look at those buildings by seeing abstractions of them. And the only way you will understand Alto is to go to Finland and see those buildings on your own. And that's, uh, if you're serious about Alto's architecture, then you must scrape up the money and go there. It's the only way. I guarantee that. Uh, as you can tell by the exhibit, uh, Alta's range of work uh, spans a whole spectrum of uh, architectural design, uh, from town planning, campus uh, master plans, civic centers, to uh, lighting fixtures, <coughs> and even door handles that fit the grip of the hand, two vases to, you know, eating utensils and even the uh, plates and the utensils for the restaurant that he designed. 
um, um, <clears throat> let's see. Um, there's one anecdote that I, I might uh, throw out immediately, which uh, I think is a very precarious one, but it will give you an idea of what Alta was about. Uh, there were some very angry parents when one of their students was uh, a student of Alta was at MIT. And the parents called the administration and said, uh, you know, we're paying all this high tuition fees and uh, our son is a student there. And you have this strange professor from Finland who, uh, when, my, when, when our son asked him, how do you make good architecture? He said, I don't know how to make good architecture. So uh, uh, the, uh, there is no way to specify all those architecture. I think it's good architecture, of course, but that could, the word good doesn't even apply, really. It's much more than that. And we'll try to elaborate on that. Um, one thing that's unique about Alta is the fact that he was the right man in the right place at the right time. That's very important to uh, uh, consider that Alto being in Finland at a time when Finland was uh, gaining independence and they were just getting into the industrialized uh, industrialization activity. They were rebuilding after the wars and so on. But Alto was there at that right time to lead that kind of design work that was needed to be done. Uh, perhaps the situation wouldn't have been as unique if it hadn't been at that location at that time. Um, so we might call it a sort of splendid isolation that he was. Uh, he also was at that time, uh, right at the modern movement time, the Bauhaus time, uh, he was getting into that kind of functional uh, architecture. And rather than having to fight the polemic that Le Corbusier and Gropius and the Bauhaus uh, had to fight in Europe, they had to prove themselves in press as well as in works. Otto just uh, in a splendid isolation just built. He said, this is the way we do it, and he just built it. So he had that kind of protection of that isolation. Um, he always liked to, uh, he would like to say that he was a very democratic architect. And he would say, well, I do acoustic spaces for churches, but also do them for the Communist Party. Um, he would do villas for the rich, but yet in the process of doing that, he would develop prototypes for uh, public housing. Um, and he also, of course, uh, he would do his uh, summer cottage for his chauffeur, so he sort of handled the whole range. <coughs> he uh, I would say that the truly serious problem in architecture uh, was to, d to discover a form for the needs of society and its individual. I don't believe that form meant a certain object, but it meant the whole form of, of, of gestures in architecture. Um, and he always, uh, I, one of his favorite uh, Figures was a Finnish philosopher who uh, developed the whole theory about play, which I can't describe to you, uh, but uh, he always felt that there should be a certain amount of play, uh, a certain amount of whimsy in architecture and design. <coughs> um, so there's the kind of mentality of play that I think you will find in Arthur's architecture, and I think it's a very important ingredient I know that uh, writer Louis Huxtable talks about the twinkle in Aldo's eye. And that's that kind of uh, special ingredient that uh, is really undefinable, but it's there. Uh, we can also look at Aldo's development of his uh, architectural style. Uh, I'm dismissing the earlier kind of neoclassic uh, brief period before he sort of arrived at the uh, modern functional type of architecture, which was very, uh, very uh, prismatic, white, uh, quite hard edge. And then we might call that his uh, first period. Um, 
We might even uh, think about uh, musical terms, it was sort of homophonic, one theme thing. Then eventually it developed into a more rich, much more uh, uh, colorful, uh, much more modulated form language, which we can call uh, red period or dynamic, which would be polyphonic, which means there are various themes going. I think that's very obviously can be seen from the uh, slides. And then it seems like in his late period, he returned to the prismatic, except that it was a com combination. It was, it was still modulated, but it came hard edge again. Now, I'm not sure why, but that seems to be a cyclical thing that uh, is apparent in all those uh, um, life cycle, let's say, of uh, themes. Um, Again, I would say that the office, uh, you might be interested in how the office function. Uh, Mr. Alto, or Professor Alto, as we called him, uh, was a maestro. Uh, unlike Frank Lloyd Wright, he did not gather us in a little group and tell us what architecture is about. He uh, really rarely talked to us. It was a very kind of formal, uh, I think based on the Scandinavian kind of uh, uh, social format, that he was a maestro. and. Uh, so there was very little discussion about why it was this way. Besides, it always seemed to be so right, there was no reason to uh, challenge him, of course. Uh, I, I think I could liken that to like E. Mustici, you may know the, uh, since you're in the Italian now, the chamber orchestra in Italy, which is a very famous orchestra. I have all of the records, but um, it was really like a chamber orchestra where there was no conductor Maybe the office chief was the first violinist. In fact, he did play the violin. He used to come in Sundays and practice in the office. But he would conduct this group, the family of musicians. And Alto wasn't the conductor. I think he was the composer. He composed the theme, and then we cranked at it. And he trusted us, in fact, to uh, <coughs> make very few sour notes, hopefully, and so on. Um, and thus, he was a masterful orchestrator of space and light. And uh, <coughs> certainly, he's a master of light. <coughs> and the seeping of space, of course, without light, there is no space anyhow. But we finish light, there's very unusual spaces, very glorious spaces, perhaps. Um, so I'm getting long-winded here, but I had one more. Um, uh, he talked very often about the principal themes in his architecture was the problem of the eye and the ear. The eye being the acoustic environment, of course, and the ear being the visual environment and the fact of the way he designed his light fixtures so that they wouldn't glare in the eye. He didn't like fluorescent lights uh, very much because they changed the skin color so you didn't look natural. And it's all these kind of humanist elements that he was always dealing with. Obviously, in Finland especially, you need the maximum of uh, natural light because it gets very dark very often, and light is like the life-giving source to the Finns and the other Scandinavians. And I always liked uh, what uh, Siegfried Gideon said about Alto. And I think he may, perhaps was the first one to really introduce Alto to the United States in his book, uh, Space, time, and architecture. But he said that uh, to him, Alto was as representative uh, of the Finns as Joyce was of the Irish. That he typified kind of the aroma of the Finns, like Joyce perhaps did of the uh, Irish. By the way, the uh, Irish and the Finns are very close, uh, a certain kind of tenor of their um, nationality. And I don't think they've ever figured out who drinks the most, but that's something else. Um, so, though Alto might have denied uh, kind of national tendencies in his art, very much like Sibelius, a great Finnish composer, constantly denied national tendencies in the music, but all he had to do is play the Fifth Symphony, and it's Finland, yeah. So there is that kind of thing when you see an alto building, especially in Finland, it has the tenor and the mood of 
that country is undeniable. Um, and I don't think that Arthur would deny it either, except that he would never admit it, but it's there. So when we can say architecture, the real thing is only to be found when man stands in the center, which Arthur has said, I believe it's even on one of the exhibition boards. And <clears throat> I know that Walter Quayle once said in a PA that this is some years ago, but he said, if anyone is to inherit Franklin Wright's broad cape, it would be Arthur, but he would tailor it into a tweed coat. <laughs> <coughs> and I suspect that there isn't anyone willing to inherit Arthur's tweed coat because uh, uh, the responsibility would be too awesome. So I'd like to start by showing you first a few uh, pictures of Finland countryside and uh, a uh, few hi historical examples of architecture that Alto is very intimately involved with and may or may, I suspect, has influenced his own kind of design thinking. Now, this is the uh, Finner poster, the Midnight Sun, you know, Finland, come to Finland, you know, this is the way it is. And I very often sound like I'm, um, you know, representing the Chamber of Commerce, but this is an actual shot that I took at a bus stop at uh, midnight. So that's the kind of uh, you know light and air that you find in the summer. Oops. This doesn't advance, the other one. Okay, another shot, you know, same kind of midnight stuff from my father's country place outside of Helsinki. Imagine again about midnight when you're just coming out of the sauna. And, uh, I certainly always find it very difficult to sleep in the summer because it's like this. I mean, how can you sleep? This is a bus stop at Alto's office, very near it. This, now we're getting into the fall scene here. And that one doesn't... Uh, now it's beginning to brood, you know, Sibelius's music is beginning to, like somebody's turning on the volume, it's getting tougher. Uh, the colors are changing, and I would like to focus this if I... <laughs> is the lecture over? <laughs> this is from, uh, this is right at Alto Studio, right at the bay of the studio. I used to watch out of the window. When I was a right sunset, I'd run with my Pentax down there. <clears throat> now that same spot, now we're getting down to, and then there it is. You know, that's what happens in December. Those ski tracks are made by two Swiss brothers and I that worked in the office. We used to ski along this bay down to a uh, very nice cafe for afternoon coffee breaks. It also reminds me that Alto, I remember one winter he <coughs> came in a ski barca and, uh, and he had his skis and he stuck them in the front of the office door. And he was always very proud to tell visiting guests at how physically fit the office is. I mean, we're mentally fit and we're physically fit. <laughs> what an outfit, you know. And his skis stayed there untouched until the snow melted and they fell down. <laughs> but the idea was there, right? That uh, symbolic statement. Now, this is not the same scene. This is in central Finland. Uh, this isn't focusing. I don't know why. There. That's near my cousin's place in central Finland. But that's the kind of climate. That's the Helsinki Harbor then in the winter. So you can see that the range of climate is very much, let's say, like Minnesota or Wisconsin or whatever. But, and it does reflect on the quality of the architecture because you have to build well to, uh, you know, Build in this kind of range of climate. Uh, now, if just a few samples of uh, historical architecture that Alto is very familiar with. These are the Middle Age uh, stone or granite uh, churches. I always like this as one of my favorite photographs uh, because it has kind of a Wyatt feeling about it. I could see that lady lying in here, you know. <laughs> but, uh, and then the Hattula church, which is one of the finest of the uh, stone churches. Now, what 
differentiates the Scandinavian, or let's say the Finnish uh, Middle Age architecture is the fact that there's a very, uh, there's a sort of a lack of decoration. Uh, further south you go, in Germany the church has become more decorated. Italy they go wild. In Finland they're very sober because they're sober, somber people. And there isn't a need to decorate. I mean, you know, the space is enough and so on. And I think Alta has the same um, idea. He doesn't decorate his buildings ever. They're, everything has kind of a reason other than simply decorative. Here's the interior of that church on the right. It's very, uh, it has been restored in the last 10 years. It's a beautiful uh, space, very, uh, well, profound, shall we say. Uh, it's nowadays it's used for uh, kind of like a museum really and they, you can rent this out like Wayfarer's Chapel for a wedding or something <clears throat> now the wood churches uh, from the middle age haven't survived natural uh, reasons and other things during the war and so on so most of the wood stuff is from the uh, 17th, 18th century this is a very humble little village uh, church eastern Finland uh, and again, it has a sobriety, though wonderfully decorated on the inside, of course. The really, the biggie of the mall is this one in uh, near Yuvaskula, where Alto uh, at his home. And by the way, I was born in the town, but uh, this is our jewel. And uh, again, note the interior, how sober, somber it is, but what a beautiful space. I'd love to rent this, you know, like for summer live there and work there. Then right at the uh, 18, uh, beginning of 1800s, uh, Helsinki had a big fire. And the uh, central part of town was destroyed, so a German architect named Engel was invited to design the cent center of the town. And he, he designed this whole complex designed all the buildings surrounding the Senate Square, as well as the cathedral and the library. Uh, what's interesting about this space, obviously it's unique because it's a one person design to begin with, but also the sloped surface of that square gives a very special dynamics to it that are, I can only describe by taking you out there, but that kind of a gentle slope has a very interesting dynamic uh, uh, effect on the, uh, obviously this is <clears throat> in May when the students get their caps and everyone goes out on those steps to catch those first rays of sun, you know. And it's like, oh, life begins anew, you know. I'm not sure as I, as the right and the left, maybe it doesn't really matter and let's not change them, but I think this was supposed to be over here because the church is here and then that was going to be there. That's fine. <laughs> this is the library across from the cathedral. Uh, typical angle thing, and uh, of course the uh, so the pastel colors, white trim, pastelish colors, and the wonderful interior uh, that I'm sure Alto probably walked in there and you know sort of cussed at Engel uh, doing such a great job. <laughs> then we get to the turn of the century, the National Romantic style. This is Sarnen, Eliel Sarnen's office outside of Helsinki where Er Sarnen was, you know, a little kid before he was brought to the state. Uh, the National Romantic period was a great coming together of all the arts in Finland. The artists, painters, uh, authors, and architects had this tremendous movement of, of, of uh, kind of National Romantic uh, themes. Uh, and in fact, they went back to some of those medieval church kind of uh, architecture in a way in this rustication and, and the form language of it. Uh, it's a wonderful place to go. In fact, uh, this is a stable building of that Sarnen place. There's a very nice restaurant now, so when you get to Helsinki, head out here. <laughs> this is Sarnen, Elias Sarnen's uh, insurance building in downtown Helsinki. You can see that heavy rusticated kind of uh, romantic uh, language of that building. Here's the entry to that, uh, um, it's an insurance building. And you know your money's safe in there, I mean, that's... 
I just wonder how they drew all this stuff. I don't know. That's Elias Sardin's National Museum in Helsinki. And again, just to show you that kind of vocabulary. And I think there's that kind of strength that's in some of Alto's buildings. It's not that obvious, perhaps, but certainly that is a tradition that he comes out of and that every Finnish architect must uh, accept as a tradition. My favorite guy is Sonk, Lars Sonk. Uh, again, the focusing on this side, please. Or do I focus it? Uh, telephone building in Helsinki that has been re-roofed. It used to have a tile roof, but uh, this guy really is, is my favorite, and I think you'll enjoy seeing Sonk's buildings. Uh, again, there's a minimum of decoration, but there's a certain amount, just those little kind of romantic symbols and things. And again, that kind of rusticated uh, um, um, uh, fabric, you might say. His great building, Songs, is the uh, cathedral in Tampere, which the interior space is, is an awesome space, very mystical, very exciting. Uh, the slide doesn't do it justice, but it's a coming together of all of these natural romantic artists, stained glass guys, and so on and so forth. Here's another one. This is a linguist now. It's the first guy to do a uh, long span kind of like Jenny's Chicago buildings in uh, steel, but at that moment he wasn't, uh, he wasn't quite ready to expose the facade, so he had to rusticate it in this national romantic kind of form, but it's a very, very fine building. It leads into a couple of his other buildings where he begins to get really more away from that rustication, almost getting Art Nouveau-ish here. Next step, he would be in uh, international style, which then also takes up from uh, Linquist. Here's the door handle for that Linquist building, which is a very nice kind of an Art Nouveau shape, perhaps shaped for the gripping of the hand. There's Alto's bronze handles, which are definitely designed for the grip and the comfort of the, the pull of the hand. In that way, we can sneak now into then the topic of our conversation tonight, which is uh, uh, Alvarado. The, this is, uh, these pictures are from the exhibit, which was a much larger exhibit than this here that toured the USA last year. And this is from its final stop, which was in Mount Angel at the Abbey. <coughs> they built the medieval tent in the grounds of the Abbey. The library is right off of there and actually exhibited all the panels on the ground. So you walk through this green moss and it had, again, a very nice kind of Finnish uh, quality to it in the way that it was in nature, kind of floating around. And the light came through the canvas and so on. There you can see the variety of alto uh, uh, furniture and so on. Here you can see more models and paintings and stuff. And really a very nice, comfortable uh, exhibit. Here's a couple of the wood bent the uh, exhibits or actual experiments that he did, which eventually these experiments then in the, in the 20s and 30s led to furniture a design and the whole production line of furniture, furniture pieces. Stools, early ones, these are late models that are covered. Those are at the Mount Angel Library. And I, I think that that to me, at least, it's the most elegant, certainly if not furniture piece, the most elegant stool that I know that exists. Some more, some very early stuff, some later stuff. Glass vases. Again, use of that same bent leg in various uh, ways. Also never denied the fact that he would repeat some themes in various situations. I mean, he didn't say, well, I can't use that again because I used it once. In fact, he used many similar ideas in various dresses. Uh, a 
light fixtures and always considering the glare so you can't see the light bulb except obviously if you look straight up um, and a whole variety of uh, uh, acoustic material and uh, even wall hangings or uh, curtain fabric designs here's an acoustic panel a ceiling panel there's a very fine light fixture and then these wonderful sketches that are uh, that are so, some are so perfect it's frightening um, wonderful fluidity of line that also you can feel when you flow through his buildings that same kind of nice line seems to be the way that space flows uh, I always thought it uh, very interesting that for instance my immediate boss when I first went to the office uh, he was trying very desperately to duplicate Alto's line and his drawings looked horrible I mean, it's just that you, nobody else can do it. But obviously, it's just, you know, there's the image sketch, there's the whole project. There were sometimes problems when we looked at them, whether they were facades or sections, we had to figure <laughs> those out. <coughs> or even plans, perhaps. And again, here, uh, this is actually in your show, but that wonderful image sketch that I always show my students at Cal Poly, I said, let's start with that because there is a whole idea that can be a whole building. That's the uh, art museum for the Shah of Iran. Obviously, Alta never got paid for it. Never will it be built, though he made models and drawings and so on. Now, I really miss that fact that this building will not be built because it would be one of, one of his fine projects. This one is one for Siena, the cultural center in the middle of a middle age fortification but again it's that wonderful I mean this is it you don't need anything more than this we'll build it from that you know that's the idea it's that kind of if you can get that germ of an idea it's not a big struggle but once you got it then it's clear sailing from there you can't go wrong of course some of my students do but I again these are from that same exhibit uh, Again, more of the other sketches. This is for the Vienna uh, uh, physical uh, sports arena, yes. Which unfortunately, again, was not built. They built the second place winner in international competition. And they've never been able to live that one down because this would have been a great project. They were too concerned about the stru structural stability of this and they didn't dare try it. And I'm sure they get flack from it all the time. Also, also was one of the first, uh, perhaps the first painter in Scandinavia to do strictly abstract painting rather than figurative, realistic painting. However, he always considered this to be part of his architectural thinking. It was part and partial of the, the, the architecture. It was just kind of dueling and thinking in architecture. And you can see that certain kind of architectural forms, like sports. Now, <clears throat> perhaps you all know, this is the 1939 Wells Fair in New York, which perhaps was a building that made Alto internationally known, or uh, let's say at least known in the States. He was already somewhat known in Europe. Um, and it also brought him the invitation to teach at MIT. Uh, again, this, this wonderful flow of space is kind of angled undulating wall which makes that space totally dynamically different from uh, normal space you know like the international school space it's a very tremendous dynamic and it's in the uh, middle 20s that he won a couple of competitions and this would be his first stage of sort a of functional international style quite prismatic but even then Alto is not willing to grid things, but he actually splays. You see those two building forms? Uh, splays so makes, again, another dynamic, totally, rather than if they were parallel, and opens up this entry area and so on. This long wing here is all the patient rooms at, at this sanatorium. 
and you have the entry area and the office spaces. There's a uh, uh, cafeteria here and other spaces and everything is kind of uh, placed in their own place and hooked together. Um, you can see that long wing. Unfortunately, these things have been closed in. They used to be balconies all the way on each floor. And uh, I remember when we, <coughs> when the person working on this was closing these things, uh, most half of the office kind of uh, rebelled against doing that, but also had consented that they can close them up because they needed the extra space. So I closed in those balconies for extra patient rooms. But, um, you can see the ends of the balconies. That's where the patient's balconies are, used to be let out. To get fresh air and, uh, and it, it was during this project that Alta devised some of the furniture, one of his earliest furniture pieces, and he felt rather than a tubular chair that was prominent in the functional movement Baja, that that tubular chair was not acoustically very comfortable, first of all, it was tinny. Also for patients to touch it was cold, so that the uh, wood bent piece would be more comfortable both visually, color-wise, acoustically, and to the touch. So he developed his series of initial wood furniture for this uh, sanatorium. He also considered the ceilings of the patient rooms. He painted those and designed them very carefully because the patient is bed prone most of the time, so they'll be staring at the ceiling, so why not have something to stare at? Plus uh, various other uh, equipment, uh, toilet facilities and things that were non-splash sinks and uh, no draft ventilation and so on. So I very carefully studied the patient condition. Uh, the other companion piece to this is the Vipri Library, about the same time in the middle 20s, late 20s. Uh, this library, here's the original shot. And again, this could be focused on, maybe I, should I run that one? Uh, this is the way it looked when I went to Leningrad some five, six years ago. Although I always like to say that the building was destroyed during the war, well, it isn't. There it is. However, it is in fairly bad damage. The Russians aren't really taking care of the building, so you wanted to forget it. Uh, again, obviously, this is that prismatic, functional, rectilinear form, but uh, even then, Alta wouldn't leave this alone, but he had to undulate something, you know, it's like he had to wriggle. So he, uh, in this uh, meeting hall, he devised the undulating ceiling, which was acoustically alive, meaning that acoustics could work either way. The person in the back row could speak to the speaker, the speaker could hear him and, and speak back and so on. So it was designed very much in acoustics in mind. You can still see the profile of that as it is in Leningrad today. I think it's been revised, but uh, uh, certainly it's still there. And of course the interior, and this is the advent then of the auto, conical skylight, which is to be his theme throughout the uh, rest of his buildings. There's the furniture. Here's a sketch by Alto how this conical skylight gives you dispersed light so you don't have shadows on books and you get uh, equal illumination throughout the building. And the other thing that you see, this kind of processional space again, there are two spaces within one. And there's obviously an inner space and outer space, but they both flow in together and it becomes one total space. So there's that modulation of levels that he uses so often, that kind of processional movement is manifested here and it becomes more intense in his later buildings. Uh, oh, I keep this wrong. Uh, here's the villa for the rich, uh, Villa Maira, which uh, this couple were really Altos Medici. Uh, they owned the paper pulp factory and uh, also developed Artec for him. Uh, and they made the furniture studies initially and then finally the furniture production. So then Alto did this uh, very wonderful house for them. Here he's talking about uh, fact that he's democratic, he says, when I do the villa for the rich, which meant Villa Maria, 
in doing that, he thinks of it as a laboratory, as a test ground, so he can design with a very nice budget and develop perhaps some forms and furnishings and so on, which may then become uh, mass-produced units for the uh, common person. Obviously, there's no finished villa that can be without a sauna and this nice pool. Uh, the other thing I always point out to my students that if you look at that plan, there's something uh, graphically balanced about it. It just looks right. I mean, it couldn't really be changed. And it does also seem to do that three-dimensionally. In other words, if you have a, if you look at Alta's plans, you can see that they seem to be very well organized and beautifully flowing. And you can rotate them around and it looks like a good design any way you look at it. And it does, I think, reflect in a three-dimensional result also. Here's the exterior of the building, at, uh, nicely nestled. These are the Finnish pine trees, which are Finnish architect's best friend because they're also straight and vertical. And they're always around every site in Finland. So every Finnish architect's rendering, you will always see these pine trees. Uh, I don't think Alto needed them, but there they are. Uh, this one, okay, he had the budget, so it's covered in teak and uh, brick uh, stuccoed and so on. There's a little artist studio here, the master of the house was a Sunday painter, let's say. And uh, uh, I think it's very nice the way those uh, window boxes are tilted. And that gives a very nice additional feeling of space inside there. And the children could sit on those window boxes and look out. Those are bedrooms. For and then screens on the outside, upper upper screens to control it, the daylight and so on. Uh, when I visited this place, I met an uh, uh, Italian artist who was uh, in residence there. Um, this is Mr. Gullickson had passed away, and Ms. Gullickson uh, didn't stay there that much, but she would have like artists could stay there in residence and use the studio. And we talked to him, and he said, "I can't paint here." He said, "He said this house is so strong in design that I can't think here. He said, <laughs> I just can't work here. It's overpowering, you know. Uh, perhaps it is. I don't know. I think it's pretty gentle in its own way, but." Then you see some of the detailing, a very nice uh, support for the canopy. But always the entry is very well expressed. There's always that understanding of where do you enter, how you flow into the space. Uh, and I think those are the auto trademarks. This is the interior court, very nice uh, glass kind of uh, in and out thing in the living room. There's a sound of that. And then the, the sauna has a nice uh, moss roof that's kind of based, it really is built in wood. And it's very much like some of the Finnish, very old country houses, so that... <coughs> <coughs> Excuse me. So the main villa is, is in this kind of, kind of dress, but then where it comes out into the sauna, it becomes very rustic. So it's a very nice kind of a theme or... Uh, again, modulation of, of, of uh, space and place. There's the interior from the living room. It's got to be the greatest stair that I know. Is that ever detailed? Just look at it closer when you get there, but uh, you know, that's like a master's thesis, you know, a stair. And that's the living room, which continues on out here. I would point out this one theme, you notice how the fireplace has that little kind of notch in it. Wasn't in, intended to have that sculpture sitting there actually, but uh, again, uh, just that little gesture that means so much because that makes that fireplace something totally different. That little gesture of a form there and the way the light falls on it and so on makes it infinitely more than just there's a blank facade. So there's those kind of nuances that uh, you notice the columns here are wrapped in the area where a person might touch them. He does that con 
always in those later buildings too, they're tiled to a point for a human touch and beyond that. Uh, so that's kind of a maintenance thing, I suppose, as well. But there's always that scale, I think, in all those buildings, even if some of them might be monumental. There's always that attention to the human scale, about the six foot and down. Railings flow, you move with the railings, they're always nicely handled and shaped. Columns are wrapped, you know, where you might relate to them. So there's that kind of scale. There's always that scale of the floor plane that uh, modulates, unrelates. And there's always a ceiling plane that seems to follow that uh, same uh, procession. Uh, I don't know why there are double columns here. I really don't know. I think Alder just said I want two columns. There's a nice little library uh, off that living room, and a nice little light uh, deal up above where you can relate the ceiling going into the library. Yet it's a private place. Uh, you can see the inside of the library there. Uh, many of you might know this. Uh, this truly is one of the classic altar buildings. Uh, classic, I don't mean by definition, but one of its great uh, masterpieces, uh, San Salo Civic Center. And this now is into the altar's red period, that more polyphonic, where there's multiple themes. You know, there's a kind of classical thrust of the major space, and there's much more in and out, uh, much more modulation now. <clears throat> the street level here are shops, which are on the street plane, and above is a library. And you go through the stairs there and you get into the civic kind of square court from two sides. Uh, and you can see this kind of form, the major form, then it's sort of very much expressed. That's a Time Magazine shot. I don't have that kind of lens that I could take kind of photo, but uh, Leonardo Musso, who is an uh, Italian architect who worked in the office for a while and is a very great Alta fan and he's a historian and wrote like the catalog for the uh, uh, Alta show in Italy. He described this to uh, he uh, said that this building is like a Bach uh, cello sonata where the theme begins and begins to build up and build up, and as you go up, the fugal theme keeps driving and driving until you arrive, as I'll show you into that council chamber. This is that upper level then, which is still public, but it also is very, in a very private, it's elevated. It's a special place, so it's accessible. There's a very humble little entry into this civic center. You can see again that, uh, uh, the detailing is not elaborate, but it's, it's really very simple, but it seems to be very meaningful. And you see that row of windows up there. That leads your way up into the council chamber. So light is part of the procession of movement. Light uh, indicates where, you, uh, you know, where, where the procession leads. That's the inside of that uh, court area. And I think there's a very nice detail here. You know, there's this little gap here in the brick there. Well, there are heaters under there in the winter. When you come out of the freezing cold, you can warm yourself by sitting on the, not yourself, but you know, your behinds, I suppose. As you would turn this way and go up the stairs to the council chamber, you confront that alto wood uh, sculpture and lead up the stairs into the actual council chamber. So here the, the Bach fugal movement is really building up and then you finally, the crescendo arriving uh, into this wonderful space that is a major space, the council space. Again, this is a Time Magazine photo, again, because I don't have a lens like that that I could describe that whole place. And there is the roof trusses that are rather well uh, known and famous. I know that uh, Alto once uh, had uh, Bruce Wari, who was a Finnish architect and a friend of his, came to the job site when they were constructing this. And Alto was all worried about these bolts that I know uh, 
process about having the boat show, you know, and he's trying to figure out some kind of cap detail to hide them. And Russo Wadi was kind of awed by this whole space and said, well, I don't understand why you're worrying about it. Look at this space. So Alto decided to leave the boats as they are and so on. Uh, this is the office uh, which was built in the uh, uh, middle 50s. Uh, Alto used to work out of his own home. He had a little office space there. Now he needed to expand, so he built his own studio building, and this is where I worked then for several years in Finland. Uh, I think it's one of his really fine projects. It's not that much talked about necessarily, but uh, it was Aldo's fortification where he could disappear and sort of lock the doors and nobody would bother him. Uh, he was becoming a very famous Finn and, uh, and he did need to do some of his design work too because otherwise they wouldn't know what to do. So. Uh, so this building was built in Helsinki then. It has a very interesting curvilinear wall. It slightly curves on this street side. On the inside it curves very much, which you'll see. You notice how the, the wall at the street curves slightly. And it almost has the feeling like the, the building was there before the street and the street had to curve because the building curves. Actually, it was the other way around. Uh, on the uh, southwest side, we, there's a little court space. And again, Alto is very interested in Italian uh, architecture. He's very much involved with Italy. And he very often uh, used the kind of an amphitheater court scheme, which would maybe is based on the Italian sort of villa uh, schemes. You can see how that main conference room there curves. It's a nice point wedge. Uh, outside, we used to meet during lunch. We had a cook, and we had lunch cooked in the office. Afterwards, we came outside to take some sun. Not in the winter, of course, but uh, with a whole range of international types. There's several Swiss, an English man, a Swede. And we uh, talk about everything else but architecture, mostly about the latest disco happenings in Helsinki. <laughs> there, then it's the inside of that curve. In this case, it's in a fairly uh, disarray because it was a big charrette for Helsinki Center project. Usually it's more clean and uh, lots of models. And that table back there is where Alto used to meet his guests. And in fact, where I, when I first arrived as an apprentice to the office, I had to go and meet him alone in person, one-to-one. Uh, -one. And he welcomed me to the office and shook hands, and I was, you know, kind of shaking the greenhorn from Berkeley, you know. Dean Worcester said it would be all right, but anyhow, it didn't help. Uh, so he said, well, I'm sorry, but Vartian and I can't promise you anything but routine drafting, but it'll get better. We just wait, it'll get better. So I said, thank you, thank you. So, and I went to lunch, and I was taken to my workstation. And I met everybody in the office, and I found out from my immediate boss that I was to do a scale study of the largest Alta Wood sculpture for New York. <laughs> and I said, routine drafting? <laughs> in fact, those pieces back there on that wall are remnants of that uh, New York project. So I knew that I was in a very special place, uh, certainly a very profound place. Uh, we used to have people like uh, Michelangelo Antonioni pass through and say hello to everybody. He did start in architecture until he figured films are more lucrative, I guess. And we had Louis Kahn come through uh, Costa from South America, America. The president of Finland came through occasionally and we all shook hands. <laughs> so it was an uh, experience that I, I certainly uh, I don't see myself forgetting ever. Also, that curved wall, uh, it's very interesting because if you walk into this conference room through this door, there's that curved wall, somehow you don't feel like you're disrupting a meeting there. I mean, you don't feel as badly about having to turn around and close the door quietly because that wall seems to give that end a place of its own. Also, it comes to a very sharp <coughs> wedge, as I showed on the outside. There were some uh, 
diplomats visiting, and one of the wives asked Mr. Alto, well, why did you do that funny corner? He said, oh, my dear lady, that's where I sharpened my pencil. <laughs> This is the other part, that curvilinear part is here. This is the normal office area then, where we used to work. And uh, there's a nice auto pictures. And uh, uh, what was curious to me, I, I know when I was there, at one time we counted there were 50 projects ongoing in the office with about maybe uh, less than 20 people working there. But that was from you know installing the la last doorknob to the beginning of a sketch, of course. But what was curious to me is that every summer, now you can see the office here, nobody's there because everyone's at their summer place enjoying the summer. In the winter, we'd spend time in the tavern because it was so dark in the office, we'd go have a few drinks. I don't know when the work got done, really, but... Uh, but you can see the typical sort of white washed interior, which is Again, all the trademark, it's also very much part of Scandinavian architecture to get more light, more reflectance, and so on. This window wall here has now the vines growing on it that were intended to be, so it's not quite as harsh. Sometime in summer, we had to put some drafting paper up there to, because um, the sun was too intense. But Also, I like to say the stair here, the office doesn't have an elevator, and uh, when I went back the last time in uh, 74 to do a schematic for a Nordic Center in Wisconsin. I spent only about a couple of months there. So I recorded it, it would be a very special uh, item. But if anyone of you know Finnish, you know Finnish cuss words are something else too. <laughs> and here, the uh, new part that kind of goes around from the conference. This was added later, and I, in fact, sat at one of these tables in my time. Uh, here's Vetsu Nava, who's a very wonderful person <coughs> that I send my students over there all the time to, so he tours them around Helsinki and uh, Finland and so on. But he was, he's, he's been with Alto's office now for 15 years or something. He used to entertain us uh, maybe once a week by coming in as Mr. Alto and there's this wonderful uh, uh, processional of greeting everybody. And then on the way back he would do each one of us, which was even more wonderful. <laughs> so he was kind of like entertaining the office as well as being a uh, you know, very excellent architect and a wonderful person. This just to prove that I've been there, that's me there in the far right rather some years ago, Mr. Alto here, and the office chief, uh, Carlo Leppinen, who uh, designed the catalog that is out there in the show that toured last year, uh, who was my office chief when I was there. We're looking over the Mount Angel library plans. Vernon DeMars, who collaborated with us, is taking a photograph. And I'd like to point out one of the very basic and most important ingredients of Finnish architecture, <laughs> that wonderful Finnish beer. Uh, now we can get to the real stuff, and I, I don't know how we're doing time-wise here. But, uh, so from that office in the late 50s, and uh, this is probably the first building that was built after the office was built. And this is a church that uh, uh, walks in this guy, in Imatra, in an industrial town on the uh, east, south. Finland. That's also a sketch for the tower. Uh, unfortunate thing happened that, uh, well, maybe I'll tell that when we get to the exterior shots. This building was uh, carefully studied in light models, sort of filtrated light model that would show the acoustic pattern because light travels similar to sound. So that's not a light study, it's a sound study. And of course models. And incidentally, uh, <coughs> Alta does not work in models. He works in image sketches. The models usually are done quite late in the stage of designing, and more often than not, for the benefit of the client, not for the design process. Uh, unlike some other architects that work 
or more strictly in models, all the work in images and sketches. This church was to be divided into three halls, so you could have one large hall, or it could be divided into three smaller parts for Sunday school like, uh, meetings and so on. There you can see that three-part structuring of this building. Here's a case where the, uh, certainly we're not into that functional prismatic era anymore, but now there's a smooth flowing form that exhibits uh, the uh, sort of interior structure on the exterior and so on. And you have entries into each sector, of course. That would be a typical uh, drawing that had to be handed into the building department, had to be inked floor plans and elevations to get a building uh, permit. This exterior then are two extreme climates. Uh, this building was designed to be in a very wooded area and unfortunately just, uh, uh, I think it was during the building process or prior to that, they had a freak tornado which tore out most of the woods. So that the idea was that that tower would extend above these very wooded area and the building would not be quite that accessible visually. Uh, another thing we used to like to talk about in the office is that no matter how we would follow up some of the altar buildings that he would always have that last chance at the building site to carry in his louvers and apply them on a building to hide our mistakes. In fact, this is one condition where there was a window there and it seemed to be too much of a void so Alta carried in his louvers and uh, smoothed it out the corner. <coughs> there you can certainly see that tripartite or the three-part function of that building very visually expressed on the exterior. Uh, that's the entry into one of the sectors with the uh, uh, stained glass window that lights the uh, central or the major space. Then you see the inside of that, then the main hall. Uh, I must say that those streaks are not a, a mystical phenomenon, they're actually scratches on the slide. <coughs> but it does have a skylight on top which lights this area in the middle of the day when the church service is occurring. Uh, here you can see the, the hall when it's closed, there when it's open. Always said double glazing, obviously double glazing is absolutely <coughs> necessary in Finland. In this case, the interior wall is sloped, and so it's a glazing, so that it has acoustic reflecting qualities as well as uh, the visual light monitor that it is. You notice that the mechanical systems are in those structural uh, beams that also house the mechanically moving walls. Uh, also didn't like uh, mechanical things necessarily. For instance, he, uh, in one of his crematorium projects, he refused to put in one of those mechanical uh, coffin uh, gadgets. He felt that man should carry away man. Uh, but in this case, there are mechanically moving walls, but then again, those walls will be set before people arrive so that the mechanical movement is not uh, part of the processional being there. It's either adjusted one way or the other way prior to the occurrence of people being in the space. Here you can see one of the monitors. You can see the mechanical, how it ties in, very nicely integrated into the structure. And of course, all the designs, everything, the lights, the organ loft and so on. Uh, now in town, this is again uh, about the same time as the church, maybe slightly before that. Also designed several buildings in downtown Helsinki. This is right in the heart, and I know those of you who have been to Helsinki recognize the Valta Grilli or the Iron House, which is across from Stockman's which is uh, considered the finest department store in North Europe, but anyhow. So Alto was assigned to do this building, which houses various offices, plus like Artec, 
and Mari Meko shopping and so on. What's really neat about this is that uh, on this very busy shopping street, these stairs lead up to an interior court, which is really kind of an extension of the street, where you can get away from the uh, uh, busy uh, action of the street. Um, so here we can just show the Marimekko and so on. Uh, there's a typical alto window with the glass is for visual light reasons and there's low panel for air so there's natural ventilation. The other thing which I find phenomenal about this building is this very wonderful gesture to its neighbor which is an Elia Sarnen turn of the century National Romantic building and how alto kind of gestures to that by winding his building and allowing this little extra piece of brick kind of caress the Sarnen building. It's like a very profound gesture, I think, uh, uh, part of Alta. Plus the fact that the building is, uh, uh, proportions are sort of considered in terms of the Sarnen building. This is the interior. Uh, And that's that interior court from which you go to various shops. And again, those are the skylights. They have a lamp fixture on the outside of the skylight, which means that the light comes in through the cone even when it's artificially lit. So you have the same sense of light source as during daytime. It also sort of more or less does melt the ice off the top of the, the glass uh, cover. This is one of our Ernie's here. I'm sure that Ernie will agree that uh, as young architects would, you know, kind of head for this place for coffee break in the afternoon because all the Marimekko models came out to have coffee. And we would have this uh, little uh, show. At, uh, now next to the other side of the Sarnen building, we just saw the building here, is yet another altar building in the corner, which is a more recent one from the uh, 60s, late 60s, which is Stockman, the department stores, bookstore and offices. So very nicely Alto is preserving the Sarnan building by having bookends on both sides, saying you can't touch this thing here because I've got you covered. Uh, the other, again, neat thing about this is that on, this is the Esplanade, which is a very long street, about four or five blocks that goes down to the harbor. It has a lot of classical kind of heritage buildings. And then Alta winds up that row. And on this side, he has added a little white marble trim just to reflect the fact that that's the classical side. Then here we go to the business side on the front. The interior again, an Alta space, obviously, with skylit monitors. Uh, and a very nice prismatic form of those, of course, makes them feel almost like ice prisons. One of the finest bookstores that I know, and uh, again, when you go to Helsinki, check the architecture books in this place. But it's that kind of gesture. Now, it's not only the light is brought in, but how it's brought in. What kind of a thing is it? It's like, again, celebrating that fact that there is, fortunately, there is light every once in a while, you know. Perhaps now we're almost beginning to get into that prismatic uh, final phase of Alta's architecture, though, uh, you know, it's on the borderline. The third building is a bank addition to an old bank building. <coughs> again, I'm showing this only because there's, again, some kind of a gesture here. Notice how the building steps down to meet that, that classical building that's part of that esplanade, that uh, park. So Alto is gesturing in scale to that. There's also another gesture. You can see how the arcade is carved into the building. This is a very narrow, one of the narrowest streets in downtown Helsinki. And Alto has expanded the street by gouging out that kind of an arcade. The third thing about this thing is it's, it's very, uh, really very smooth, very non-relief in a way. There's, I think there's a reason for that too fact that the building does reflect a sunk National Romantic building that's across the street, which is one of the monuments of National Romantic. This is a stock exchange building. And all this building then is very relief-like to reflect 
and sort of gesture to this very strong leaf building here, so he doesn't want to bother it. It's very uh, discreet. Uh, another anecdote here, Alto called the bank president and he said, uh, you know, we could do this facade in copper, but bronze wouldn't be too bad either, you know. We could get a much finer, you know, edge. The bank president said, Alvar, don't ever call me again. I don't want, don't ask me these questions. Do what you want. So I was done in bronze. At a cost of perhaps 10 times as much, but. <laughs> now here's uh, really that uh, uh, building that certainly is totally shaped by its function. It's a concert hall. This is the acoustic space for the commonest. Uh, it also acted as the, the hall where the Helsinki University, I mean the Helsinki Radio and uh, City Symphony used to play until Finlandia Hall was built, which is now the present uh, home of the, the symphony. But obviously this whole building now, the exterior and the interior are sort of one flowing shape, really expressible of its uh, uh, nature. And again, that ceremonial process of arrival and all these things leading out into the hall and uh, this beautiful leather-wrapped, uh, um, kind of strapped uh, <coughs> handrails and so on. See the exterior here in the entry. In this case, Alto devised a wedge-shaped uh, brick that was used throughout so you could make those curves work. Now here again, the man in the right place, in the right country, fin Finland is very craft-oriented and they're very uh, much involved with the, the arts and crafts, and Alta could tell the brick company that I'd like to have this tile or this brick made, and they said, sure, how many you want? So many thousand, and put them on. Copper roofing, which is very common in Finland because Finland produces a lot of copper, and uh, perhaps it's more in the long run, is, 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 uh, 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 its cost is not as phenomenal as here in the sense that the maintenance is much less than the painting metal and so on. Here's the interior of that hall. Not a very great shot, but uh, there's actually a better photograph in the exhibit. You can see that flowing form that. Uh, uh, also, the acoustic material here is applied only where it's needed, so it becomes like a mosaic pattern rather than trying to hide some kind of a total surface with acoustic behind. All of this says, well, we need that much, let's put it on there. Uh, another building is mostly this on the 50s. Uh, Alta's own summer house, which is right across from that civic hall that we saw earlier the brick building. Uh, this is a boat he designed to get there and we got across the uh, piece of lake there they had to go. Here's the building and uh, here I think is an example of what Arthur's talking about, the uh, fact of uh, kind of play and experimentation in architecture. He always felt that for a client that the amount of play must be very restricted. You have to be very uh, careful as to how much to experiment. There must always be experimentation for the art of architecture to advance. But with, perhaps for a real client, you must keep it under control and you can't do carefree kind of playing around. But when you do your own summer house, anything goes, right? So, uh, again, <coughs> this building is based, as you maybe saw in a plan, on a kind of a court scheme, kind of Italian uh, Villa Court has a nice fireplace right in the middle there where Alta would entertain guests in the summer and have some nice roaring fire and sort of very mystical, uh, exciting. I'm sure he made the most of the theatrics of that. Then the building sort of <coughs> filters on through with various studio spaces and things. Here he uh, has experimented with uh, solar, for instance, and one of those parts is not at all mechanically uh, equipped so that he's trying to see what solar may do. The building is also placed on the terrain in terms of the base of the terrain, like the granite base. So there isn't a modular structural system, but structure is where 
the ground will support it. So he's trying all these weird things that the client would uh, certainly not understand. Also, on the inside of that court, Alto has used every brick available in Finland, every kind of masonry joint, every kind of floor tile, just to experiment. And of course, it's great fun uh, visually. Uh, one of my students showed me this. I, I don't know exactly how to react, but uh, Now we got a few more slides in the other trays. Uh, I guess, did I promise to? Yes. <laughs> I think I promised to quit by 10. Uh, it recalls me uh, one of Alto's uh, talks to the Swedish League of Architects. Uh, he was saying that, uh, that he always liked what uh, Brock used to say about painting process. That Brock used to say that what's really unique about painting is that you never know where it leads. I mean, when he starts, he doesn't know what the end result is. And the exciting thing is the process of, of arriving there. Uh, but you don't know when. And as I said, it's sort of like giving a, giving a speech that, that uh, he doesn't really know what the theme is. He doesn't know what he's going to talk about. But he did promise them that he would stop by midnight. <laughs> so, uh, this is the other villa for the rich. This is uh, Masson Carré. And these, by the way, are photographs from one of the global architecture mags. These aren't mine. Uh, this is kind of his second villa for the rich. Carré was, is an uh, art dealer in, uh, and it's outside of Paris. And he asked Alta to design his house and also a gallery space in there to house some of his rare legeres and so on. This, uh, this one was uh, really a sort of trial by fire for the second Mrs. Alto, Elisa Alto. She was really in charge of this building, did most of the furniture design, of course, worked with Alto very closely. The earlier Mrs. Alto, I know Alto, who was the previous Mrs. Alto, of course, was very influential in the furniture design. In fact, Probably we could uh, say that she, more than Alto himself, designed a lot of those furniture pieces. Uh, which brings up another anecdote. Uh, somebody asked uh, Mr. Alto how he chose his second wife, you know. And he said, well, I chose the best architect, woman architect in my office. The one with the best hand. Whatever that's worth. <laughs> the other thing I forgot to mention in conjunction with the office, there was an Indian architect who came to the studio and was, was able to meet Mr. Alto, which always wasn't easy. Uh, but anyhow, he was very anxious to uh, talk to Mr. Alto, especially uh, what he wanted to know. And the office chief was with Mr. Alto when they met this Indian architect, not American Indian, India. And he said, what I really need to know is what is what what kind of module do you use? What is your modular? Mr. Alder said, what? I don't know. He asked the office chief, do you know? The office chief said, sure I know. It's one millimeter or less. <laughs> and you see some of that. I mean, it's one millimeter or less, but really counts in this, a lot of this stuff. That's the other side of this building. and. Uh, Here's a model of the interior gallery and the section of it. And again, that fine undulating line that, uh, uh, whereas we could design most things, but every once in a while we get to like this kind of curve and we didn't know how to draw it. I mean, we did 8,000 undulations and it didn't look right. So finally, somebody would grab Mrs. Alto and would you please get Mr. Alto to look at this? And then finally, at last, two weeks later, he'd arrive. We'd have to leave that portion out of the drawings and say, how do we do this curve? And he'd go, ah. He would use his fingernail. He'd just kind of grind into your paper. And it was absolutely right every time. He just said, oh, why didn't I think of that? It's perfect. <laughs> it's, I think, a very fine uh, gallery space and a nice kind of 
again, that flow of space and the fact that there's light, not, not really never from one direction, but always balanced directional light, some from the back, some from the front, that works with that undulating uh, processional movement of space. Then you see the furniture of design specifically for this place. And the light fixtures, the auto uh, standing lamp. And again, that kind of spiral thing is so that you can't get the glare, but it filters the light. <coughs> and I think a very interesting light fixture here, which is designed to down light, but also light toward the paintings. That's one of a kind, that's, uh, that is not a production line item specifically for this project. Then we go back to Finland and uh, to the Technical University. Uh, Mr. Alto designed the whole master plan and the central building, which I'll show, show next. But earlier in the 40s, he designed this little sport hall on that same campus. What I think is really neat about this is kind of the tone of this wood uh, structural system. This is a uh, enlarged model of a uh, sort of prefab housing unit. So what he did is he multiplied the, the truss ten times and had it built for the sport hall and it has a very nice tone about it I think. But then the real jewel and one of the altars, you know, really again classic projects is this uh, central building for the campus, which has a dual auditoria as a major hub. It's a central point of the campus. And there are all kinds of physics labs and architecture labs and other uh, lecture halls, plus the uh, administrative wing, plus a, a, a more recent uh, library that hooks to this. Here's a this is then a typical auto studio model no color, they're either white or they're in natural veneer wood like this. This would certainly be built for the client, not for the study in the office. By then, that's the design is set. As we tour around it, you can see the actual building. Then the south facing auditorium. Uh, again, there's that amphitheater thing which then steps up into being the light sources for the interior. Uh, very exciting kind of trusting form, certainly reminiscent of, let's say, Greek or Roman uh, amphitheaters in the two times of the year. The winter is kind of fun when they have uh, lectures inside and they have lights on, it's like a lantern, it sort of sits there and uh, glows. But uh, here again, the, the integration of the structure, the whole thing is really one integrated form those structural members are so designed that the light does not <coughs> penetrate directly into the eyes of the audience. And they, of course, obviously also the opposite structural system has a mechanical system. Here again, that same thing, the acoustic uh, treatment is only in that area that requires it. This space uh, is really very profound when you enter it. I mean, the slide does not show you the elegance of the space. It's traditional in, in Scandinavia that the main lecture hall of the university has this kind of elegant form and space. It's their pride and joy. It's kind of monument, really. And again, all the furniture fixtures and everything has been designed in the office specifically for this project. And just to show that we may repeat the same theme, this is that's very much the same kind of section, but now horizontally for a church in Bologna, Riola, which has recently been completed. These are obviously uh, model studies in the office. Another civic center, uh, St. Aoki. In this case, a whole civic complex for a very central eastern part of the country. Uh, it's like a civic uh, political center of that area, country. <coughs> civic hall, theater. There's a library there. I'll show you interior of that underlying form. 
and the main church in the parish hall, you can again see that kind of modulation, that uh, thrust of the horizontal, I guess vertical, plus the dark shape of the uh, uh, city uh, chambers. Um, this building is interesting in that it is uh, tiled in porcelain Arabia tile. Now you might know the Arabia, Arabia as you say, uh, cobalt blue coffee cups. Well, that's the same cobalt blue. It's a tubular tile, obviously set in panels and then set in place. What I found interesting about this is that the building has a life, a uh, sort of colorful life of its own because depending on the time of the day and the sunlight and so on, it may change from a blue to a greenish to a bronze to a bright orange at sunset. Uh, so it's kind of a glowing, it's a central building in town and it has that kind of a uh, interesting life uh, in tone. And this thrust shape here, that's the church and that's the interior of the council chambers. Uh, a very nice kind of civic steps and the pool and then the library is across from this. That's the interior of the library. Again, notice the balanced light. There's light from that source, light from this side. So it has a nice total quality to the light. And then since that uh, library, there's the latest library, which is the one at Mount Angel, which really is a sister library. To, there are three models that are based on this kind of central control and that kind of fan shape. Uh, library uh, uh, hall. It was very interesting when we had that exhibit up at Mount Angel and my ex-office chief came up there, he told me the anecdote. Now, this may not be an anecdote, but he did tell me that, you know, I forgot to tell you, but once Alta told me that, he said, gosh, I don't think we can do a fourth library like this. Three is enough, maybe too many. Let's not do a fourth based on the same scheme. Uh, on the other hand, it works because there's central control and then this large hall that you can uh, service from one point. Uh, it's interesting, the Benedictine Abbey, when they uh, contracted Alta to do this building, they had considered some other famous architects and finally wrote to Mr. Alta. And, and I think he enjoyed the idea of doing it for the Benedictines, which are uh, are well known for uh, educators in the Western world and a long history of, of culture. And so he was taken by that idea. Otherwise, he might not have accepted the uh, <clears throat> project. Perhaps also the fact that I was in the office and I could handle it in the States might have been influential on that. Uh, it's interesting that the Abbey didn't have any money when they actually started this project. They didn't have the money. So about about halfway through construction, finally one industrialist donated the money for the building. Uh, this is taken from one of the monks is flying over the Abbey and I'm taking it hanging onto the door of this airplane. <laughs> it was the most terrorizing ride I've ever had because we had to land in that field. I, I thought for sure it was the last photograph I ever took. <laughs> you can see the entry area and then it cascades down uh, down the hill slope. There's the model that was originally done in Finland in the conference room there. This is a later model uh, down in Vernon de Mars office when I was there. Uh, I always like to tell my students that there was a time when I uh, really <coughs> dearly needed some of those aspirins that I use for skylights. <laughs> but, uh, you can see the now this is unusual in a sense from the other fan shape things that this is the first one that has double space and even a triple space that cascades down. There's a very nice processional arrival, always a skylight kind of pointing each occasion. And then the main skylight that lights that sort of dual story space. There you can see a typical scheme and that's uh, again one of those well organized to arrive and there's a lobby 
and you go down the hall to the staff or you come into that meeting room in the front or then through into the library. There it is. Also, the uh, <coughs> stacks are so spaced that at that control corner you can see every aisle all the way around. So, you, you know, if somebody needs help over there, they can wave and you say, I'll be right there rather than. So, yeah, this nice. Uh, 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 not really a control facility, but it's a, a service facility it will help. Here's the library then. It's uh, faced in this kind of brick, which we probably wouldn't have used, except that the other buildings on the campus are, or in the Abbey are, uh, of the same kind of brick. So we used a limited pallet of that kind of brick that was already there. Here's the entry. A little teak trim on those uh, columns, which I thought was uh, not a bad idea by me to do. You know, since uh, I very seldom was able to contact the office, so I had to play auto, and I uh, tried my best. I, I finally learned what that one millimeter or less is about, let me tell you. Here's the lobby then, and a little trim detail. From here you go to the staff area or into that conference or rare book room actually and it's also a kind of a meeting room. Here you can see the access into the staff area, skylights again providing light. There's the entry into the rare book and meeting room with acoustic ceiling and so on. Lights from uh, all the furniture, lighting fixtures were sent from Finland. This meeting room and a little acoustic uh, thing with speakers and stuff and so on. And I really had to figure out the spacing of all of these and uh, you know so on and so forth. What I what I found very interesting when I was in Finland learning this vocabulary that that uh, most of Mr. Alto's uh, sections, like trim sections, are really much smaller than you think. So if you take like 15% less than you think, you, you're about there. Here's the main hall then of the library, the skylight. And uh, in between, second level that has reference books and the reading spaces all around. <coughs> and then the stairs that kind of flow down, it's always that kind of a nice movement. It's almost like cascading. Uh, uh, fluid water flowing the moment throughout the uh, building. Um. Okay, now I better run here. This is the Student Union Uppsala, Sweden, that I worked on quite a bit of the detailing on. Here's all the sketches that are quite advanced. Obviously, now we don't have to worry which is section, which is is a plan, or is it. I mean, those are obviously exterior perspectives. He was very concerned about the trees that surround this building and about saving the court yard that was there. This is the building that's hooked onto an existing building. And again, it has three parts and it's uh, <coughs> uh, in the hall above, which I'll show in a moment. And again, those tiles there on the ceremonial side, they're not on the other side or on the other columns. Uh, here's an auto sketch and there's the final working drawings. You can see that arrival lobby which is elevated from uh, the ground from where you then go up three different stairs because it all is divided into three parts or well, one total part. There's the auto sketch of the upper part. There's a, a finished drawing of that. And these very curious ears that poke out of the building are the uh, movable walls that move out into the ears and open up the central space. So they go on into these uh, ear containers. Uh, uh, here, perhaps Alto is exercising some of his whimsy. This is for students, and why not have ears in the house? And, uh, plus, they work very well because it opens up the whole space. You don't have these messy little accordion walls and things, but they're actually very fine panel doors that slide on tracks and uh, here's a section that was one of my first drawings there but you can see those three st 
stairs that lead you up on the second level and up into each sector of the building. On the opposite side, on the sunny side, Alta has carved the building out to allow more light into that court underneath. And of course, that makes for a very interesting feature on the building. It's, uh, he just doesn't leave the box alone. He's got to carve it or twist it or undulate it. Here's the uh, lobby area, and then you lead up the stairs into the main hall, and there's a little floating stair up to the uh, slide podium. Uh, here's the upper hall, uh, as it is with the doors open. There's a little cafe, bar room uh, in the back through those doors. And again, just a simple little gesture, but that door is in an inset. It makes it infinitely more interesting, obviously, than just a door smack on the wall. There's a sense of arrival in place and then passes through. In this case, they couldn't afford the altar furniture except in the <coughs> cafe. Okay, now we're getting just a few last buildings that uh, are fairly recent from the late 60s, 70s. There again is that wonderful auto kind of image sketch which says the whole building is right there. This is an art museum in Aalborg, Denmark. And you can see that nice section up there where the light is uh, uh, monitored in without in direct light on the paintings. In fact, the monitor inside was to have a uh, sort of area space where people would walk in and adjust lights and so on. This is definitely Alto's last period. It's uh, back to the prismatic, the hard edge, but very much modulated at the same time. That's a great lantern there that allows light in the center hall. And also some of the side lit uh, galleries. It's a very nice amphitheater. Again, somehow reminiscent of the Technical University Hall, but in this case, an exterior uh, amphitheater. And here's the interior of the galleries with that light monitor. Actually, I think this is a little bit dark. Obviously, always the problem with slides is that the uh, light quality and the color is not exactly right ever. So again, it's that thing that you must go and see to get the real picture. So here's this uh, big glass monitor, which is very high and deep so the light again bounces in there and bounces off these variety of structural slab uh, members and curving linear forms to filter the light so there's no direct light on the interior. The major auto project that's uh, been ongoing since the 50s is the Helsinki Center project and he did the master plan for the Helsinki uh, Center project and then design these cultural buildings along the inlet from the ocean. It's in the heart of town. And the first building here is Finlandia Hall, which is the only one so far completed. Since this scheme Alta has revised it so that the second building there, which is there, is now at this end here, it's the opera, and the other buildings are not there, so it's open park. And there are only those two hubs, kind of cultural hubs, uh, uh, hubs in this park setting in the heart of uh, Helsinki. Here's Finlandia Hall. There's a model in the office uh, of that with a extended wing here that has funny kind of nice curvilinear edge which follows the positions of the trees so it allows the trees to remain there. Um, this certainly is the final round of Alto's cyclical thing where it's very prismatic but it's very modulated. Here you can see the hall by the bay. That tower is Eliel Sarnen's National Museum that we saw the front facade of. And again, the model to uh, relate to that. Here's the exterior of the hall. Obviously, that's a great symphony hall there. The little thing that sticks out there is the chamber hall. And then you have the conference uh, wing beyond that. Uh, it's a very elegant. This perhaps is as monumental as Alto has ever been, but again, I think the detailing kind of elegance and the uh, proportions of things 
uh, give this a scale that doesn't seem to be awesome or monumental. There's that low sort of consideration of that one millimeter or less that perhaps uh, uh, makes it less monumental. That must be the traffic on Monerheim Street, I don't know. And here's that nice last part of that hall for the Congress uh, wing. And as you can see again, the very intricate, uh, very uh, floor plans that again, everything is in the right place in a very complicated way, but some are still comfortable. And there is a procession which uh, uh, occurs throughout that, the arrival up to the concert hall and so on. You can see some sections in the, the main plan of the hall. <coughs> Here's all those sketches of the interior, and that's a drawing based on one of those light models of the acoustics of it. But it seems that the music is already here, you know, in that sketch. Here's a very early uh, model, again, I think more for the client than for our study of the ceiling. This was to have a acoustically operable ceiling that could be tuned for the, uh, obviously for the official opening of the hall, but it could be tuned depending on what kind of music was played there. Could be tuned for Mozart or for Wagner. Anyhow. Here's a very large model of this thing, again for the client so I could walk in and, and see his, you know, his building. Here it is actually when the Helsinki Symphony is playing there, the actual thing. You can see those curvilinear forms again, although it's of course worked in that kind of wood bent shapes. In this case, rather than being decorative, of course there's an acoustic quality of that kind of wood uh, section that that wall is made out of, as well as being decorative element, of course. Here's part of that model again, and there's the actual thing on the construction. And here's the hall, as it is, uh, is completed. Really very elegant place. The acoustics are, I guess, fair, <laughs> than told. Uh, you know, it's, uh, I mean, no architect should be embarrassed about acoustics because it's not a, a definable science. And just like many other architects, Aalto did not attend the opening concert. He wanted to hear from others what the acoustics was like. You know. It's a very nice lobby in there as you arrive to that concert hall. And again, this, this was one of those things that are sort of happened during the process of the building. Uh, these gadgets here for the vines and the lights were not originally designed, but there was too much light coming through that window wall, so all the design is very interesting an undulating track with these lights hanging from it and these plants and then it has a nice filtered quality of light that comes. Here's the lobby as you then arrive up into the concert hall. Here you are at the concert hall level looking down into the lobby. <coughs> and then uh, the opera uh, hall in Essen, Germany which has a very long history. It was an uh, international competition at Alta One. And apparently what the uh, city of Essen did, they had a big model of the city and each international competitor had to have a model with a base that would fit into that city model. And as I understand it, when Alta's model was placed and everybody was quiet and they said, that's it. It seemed to be perfect, you know. This would be one of his great, great projects. Uh, and I'm not sure what the, uh, at the moment, I think there's some budget problems with the city, but all the plans have been drawn and it's ready to go. Uh, here again, that very wonderful sort of uh, um, undulating shape that says it's, it's a opera hall. An interior lobby model of that certainly would be one of the exciting spaces. Now these models were done by my Swiss friends, not that one, but this one. And when I arrived at the office and they were working on this and I looked at some of their drawings, I thought I would never make it because 
you know, they're like watchmakers. I mean, I've never seen a more perfect line. I mean, every one of those balsa strips is absolutely equally spaced. I mean, it's like real. You know, you could just pipe music in it and put a little people in it. It's a hall. <laughs> now, in this case, now that curved form now has another function. It's curved in two directions. So at least become acoustic reflectors as well as perhaps uh, decorative elements. Uh, so I would think that this would be a, a magnificent building and I hope certainly it will be built someday. <coughs> now we may return to the uh, Shah's Art Museum. You saw that little sketch, this is a model of it. It's a very interesting ceiling where the top had louvers before the light even got in and then the light would come filter through those monitors. Unfortunately, this won't be built. I'm uh, very sorry there isn't. Uh, I think it'd be one of his very fine projects again. Certainly this one that I showed earlier, that civic center that sits in the middle of Siena's middle age fortification. And uh, there's a wonderful drawing, which I don't have a slide of, but uh, Alto insisted on having a cross section through Siena, the town, the Campidoglio, and that central, all the way to that fortification with his little building there to show you know, the pattern of that section. So here was this wonderful tower that's in the heart of town. And then you go over here, and here's Alto's little tower, you know. So it was like kind of playing, kind of. Uh, so with that, uh, I'd like to close showing you a very late picture of Mr. Alto not long before he passed away, and a bust by a Finnish uh, sculptor, Mr. Alto, and I, I certainly must say that I uh, certainly miss his having passed away, and I hope and uh, perhaps I know that you may be inspired by his work that remains behind for us to study and enjoy. So thank you. I was said if there's any questions, I would entertain those. Maybe not, it's pretty late. I'll ask them at the gallery. Please join us at the gallery, which is just down the road. Do you want the this? That is great. <laughs> I've got some slides to trade with you. Oh, yeah? All right. I hate you. Well, I. Uh,